Hey, everybody. Welcome to another exciting episode of Clinic Gym Radio. I am your host, Dr. Josh Satterley, and it's my pleasure to be joined yet again by our man from Oregon, Guido Van Rysigen. Did I say that correctly? Rice again. Rice again. Uh, close. Happens all the time. Uh, yep. Well, it's certainly a, a memorable name because you're a memorable guy. And so it's not, you know, it's not John Smith from Oregon. So I guess that that's good. Yeah. So Guido, uh, our listeners probably heard you and I, it's gotta be going on a year ago, maybe, maybe nine months, but I have absolutely no reference for timeline anymore. <laughs> the last two years feel like it could be two months or it could be five years. So but you are a strength conditioning specialist from the beautiful state of Oregon, but you've worked in major league baseball. You've worked in all sorts of pro sports. Can you give us a little quick refresher on your professional background? Sure. Um, I'm originally from Belgium where I was a medic uh, for the commandos and the military forces. I went to school. Uh, I really didn't know what I wanted to do initially. My mom was a nurse and she said, why don't you do that? And you know, help people and science and all that stuff. So I worked in the ER and intensive care for about 12 years. In the meanwhile, I played baseball. Uh, but while I was going to nursing school, you know, that didn't work out. I couldn't practice like the other guys. Started getting interested in their injuries. Uh, started communicating with Dr. Job in California. But for the young listeners, by the way, this was by letter. You know, you had a typewriter. That was a big freaking deal. Uh, internet was non-existent. Uh, this guy thought it was, you know, fascinating that somebody from Belgium wanted to know about baseball. Make a long story short, uh, several years later, I was a strength coach and so-called athletic trainer of our national team as also a local team. And then I met a guy in Paris by the name of uh, Johnson, and he actually introduced me to the Seattle Mariners. And about a year later, my wife and I sold everything we had. We came to the University of Oregon. I obtained a dual master's degree there. Worked for the Kansas City Royals, Texas Rangers, became the medical coordinator of the Baltimore Orioles. Then uh, left professional baseball, went to Oregon State University, uh, was there for uh, oh, about 12 years. Uh, started doing more and more international workshops. Uh, created a private school in uh, Beijing, China on sports science and uh, sports medicine. And now, of course, with COVID, that's all, you know, belly up, you know, everything's on Zoom and so forth. So... Staying busy, uh, definitely. Uh, I've been a student in uh, exercise science and sports medicine for the majority of my life, and continue to read on a daily basis. It's awesome that you have you've you've seen all levels from academia to professional sports to um, you know the local local gym and even trained yourself, obviously, which is where the curiosity already always starts, right? You're uh, luckily for all of us in strength and conditioning that. IRB doesn't apply to yourself. <laughs> you can <laughs> you can do as much crazy research as you want on yourself. So, um, but you know there are always advances and whatnot in in all professions, but certainly health and and human performance seems to be advancing at crazy rates with the ability to throw a you know to track data with an accelerometer that's already in the phone everybody's carrying, or video breakdown or you know analysis. Uh, I saw <laughs> this new. A camera from I don't know how to say the the Chinese company, Huawei. Uh -huh. uh, supposedly it can shoot video natively at ninety six hundred frames per second. Oh, isn't that insane? I mean, it, you know, you used to not even be able to buy something that could go over one hundred twenty, and here we are, like it's just part of the camera. Anyways, uh, as I say that, what what is exciting now? What what's new and exciting that you're looking at going, hey, this is really going to impact the world of strength and conditioning? Well, uh, for the last 15 years, I've been uh, reading up and studying and actually was involved in a couple of researches on the uh, the uh, the concept proprioception. Mm -hmm. The reason is, you know, as the Internet started becoming more and more accessible to everybody about 20 years ago. If you would Google balance exercises and then simultaneously would Google proprioceptive exercises, they look exactly the same. And right. so that did not make any sense to me whatsoever, because in my opinion, balance is just a skill. And, and just like any skill, we can get better at it with practice. Well, proprioception is a sense. It's like taste. It's like smell. Can we improve taste? Can we improve smell? 
I mean, some people right. have debated with me and said, I took this wine tasting class and, you know, now I can separate the, the oaky flavor and the cherry flavor in my wine. And my argument is always this. Well, it's actually your coach, let's call it, that gave you a representation that said, don't you taste this? And then you have a personal sense of what oak or what cherry might be like. And, and that's why often, mm. you know, if you look at these uh, world events where they they taste these uh, wines for their quality and the top wines mm. are often very cheap wines and not necessarily, you know, very expensive wines. So senses are personal, in my opinion, and it's quite a bit of, you know, research attached to that. So proprioception and balance are not the same. And so as I started reading up, I was still at Oregon State University there. I had the fortune to have a student that worked with me by the name of Dean Kim. He's from uh, Vancouver, BC. He's a, a brilliant young man. He's a kinesiotherapist, but also a heavy reader. And so him and I uh, wrote a paper called uh, The Myth of Proprioception. And you can look it up. You know, it's a free PDF mm -hmm. online. And that's about 10 years ago. Well, about a year ago, I contacted him again and I said, hey, we need to update this paper because there is more information now what proprioception really is. Uh, there are some prominent international researchers that have done some phenomenal work. So by starting to update our paper, I ran into the concept of actually effort, force, and heaviness, which is obviously directly related to athletic performance as also rehabilitation. And I kind of call it the missing components of proprioception. We often don't consider that as being a part of what proprioception really is. Right. Although the information is nothing new. I mean, uh, Sir Charles Sherrington in 1906 was probably one of the first researchers that looked at proprioception in his days and already included in his definition that effort, force, and heaviness are a component of proprioception. But in reality, you know, including myself, I must honestly say, most of us have totally ignored this concept. You know, we started doing balance exercise and all kinds of crazy what I call circus acts. And then we claimed that our circus act would improve proprioception. Well, like I said, it's a sense. It is not a skill. So a balanced test is not a good measure of how you, you're doing proprioceptively. But the good news is for the last, I would say, 15 years or so, more and more researchers are starting to look at this concept of census, uh, of effort, force, and heaviness, and how it's related to specifically performance. So let's just tease this out real quick because I want to make sure my listeners can understand and, you know, balance and proprioceptive are probably <laughs> something better done on video rather than an audio format, but we can certainly talk about the research or not. Balance, if I can just simplify it, I know this isn't perfect, but balance is the ability to maintain uh, an upright posture. Is yep. that a decent, okay. Whereas yeah. proprioception is controlling the exact placement of your limbs in space, uh, both reactively and proactively. Yeah, that that might be a uh, you know pretty decent. Yeah, I just made those up on the fly, so if they're not good, tell me. But. <laughs> the most recent, uh, well, here here's the dilemma in the research. If you read the most. Uh, you know, famous researchers on proprioception, mm -hmm. you'll actually see that there's, they, they don't always necessarily talk the same language. And yeah. so e it even depends sometimes on where they on the, on what side of the planet that they are. Mm -hmm. uh, because until relatively recent through the internet, they had very poor chance of communicating with each other. So the majority of researchers that looked at proprioception looked at small components of proprioception. But proprioception is a lot more complex than keeping your body in space and your limbs in space. It includes also things like joint repositioning sense, body repositioning sense, and then relatively recent, the senses of effort, force, and heaviness. So what occurs now when we lift up something that has a load? Now, this could be a grocery bag. Well, of mm -hmm. course, it could be a very heavy, let's say, kettlebell or, or dumbbell or barbell in our gym. Well... In fact, exercise using load or resistance, I should say, right? Augment our senses as their heaviness requires effort and force to overcome. So heaviness is something that you either predict 
like I was involved in a study where we looked at uh, power lifters and they typically use different sizes of bar uh, of plates on the barbell or the plates have a different color. So yellow is lighter, red becomes heavier, maybe black is the heaviest, right? That's actually culturally biased. So when I'm in China, red, which is a, a color of uh, happiness and joy, while red typically in our Western culture is a, a color of, hey, stop, you know, like a traffic light, be careful, uh, as, a, as a traffic sign, for example. Uh, our body interprets that sense of heaviness before you even touch it, Completely different. So we need to be, and, and people know that I do this, or at least try to do it as best as I can, to be culturally sensitive when we talk about some things. Because pain, for example, has a totally different meaning in Hispanic mm -hmm. populations versus Caucasian populations. But that's not the topic today. So even before we lift something up, our internal model, we call this, or our prediction model, already is assessing what, how heavy something is going to be. Now, mm -hmm. we're then putting out this effort and force in the anticipation that what we think the heaviness is, is correct. And so the relationship between the three senses, effort, force, and heaviness, are always related to each other and constantly change. Now, that's a beautiful thing because it means we can manipulate it. And that's basically what I've been doing in the last couple of years, working with some very strong people uh, like a Chris Duffin, you know, one of the five yeah. stars on the freaking planet and other athletes and non-athletes and how I can now manipulate their workout to either drive effort, force or heaviness. So if you go to somebody like Duffin, <clears throat> who we can say has absolutely maximized the probably the number of repetitions he's done in his life for, for back squat is top 1% of the 1%, right? And certainly the heaviness on any marker, but especially as it relates to pound lifted per pound of body weight, that guy's pinning the needle on both sides, right? Like he is as good as they come. How does this research affect uh, or, or would it change any of the methods approaches, training modalities for a guy like that? Okay, well, a real practical uh, uh, example with him was I was in EXOS uh, doing a presentation on movement variability and, uh, or it was proprioception, I don't remember exactly, but anyhow, Chris Duffin was there and in a casual conversation, kind of off the grid, he said that his training was being limited because he felt an incredible amount of tension. Now, the regular person would call it pain in his low back when he was deadlifting, which required him to do to apply more resting periods. So his rests had to be longer. He would be in a flexed position trying to so-called stretch those muscles. And then at the end of his workout, he really noticed that his total volume which is reps multiplied by your sets, multiplied by your weight, was not getting up to par. And so, for especially for a power lifter, total volume of training is absolutely critical, right? Time under tension, there's all kinds of other factors. But here was his limiting factor. His back was becoming uncomfortable and uncomfortably tight. So And, and starting to know, erode his, his not, not just, hey, it's, un, it's tight, because I'm sure that dude is, push through tightness uh, more times than the average human, but it's literally the lim the single limiting factor to achieving his goal. Yes. Now, like I said before, in the average population and even lifting populations, they might even go see a clinician and say, hey, my back hurts when I'm deadlifting too much weight or something like that. Now, this guy is a smart weightlifter. You know, I have tremendous respect for him, not only as an athlete, as an individual, uh, but also he's smart. He can analyze what he's doing. So his language even changes around, you know, it's uncomfortable versus pain. So there is no real injury there, right. but and it limits his weightlifting routine. So what did I, I do based on effort, force, and heaviness concepts, which, which we can go a little bit more in detail here in a minute. I actually gave him isolated 
abdominal curl exercises. Now, this sounds freaking crazy, right? So I changed the stiffness of his low back, the, that maximum contraction, that go get tenor organ sensitivity. It goes through the roof with people like him at his caliber. The stiffness of those muscles because of the sensitivity of go get tenor organ sensitivity. I changed it by actually giving him, in his case, you know, he's so freaking strong, a very challenging uh, type of sit-up where he was holding heavy dumbbells. He's curling up. And he's holding that somewhat isometrically while he's doing a boxing maneuver at a relatively fast pace. How long, people ask me, do you do this for? Until he gets stiff. So the moment he felt a stiffness in his abdominals, abdominals, and I pushed him through where he almost failed. Then he got back under the, under the bar and had no pain whatsoever. Now, the smart guy that he was, he already used something similar before in his career as kind of a prep, as kind of his personal warm-up before he deadlifted. But since I've done it with him, he actually uses it between sets now. So we change that level of effort in that sense to a, the opposite component in his scenario, and bingo, back pain immediately disappeared. He's able to lift longer, more heavier weight, volume goes through the roof. So that's a real practical example there. So let me just uh, illustrate this because I had a similar experience, but nowhere near. I think real quick, we started talking about Chris Duffin, and I want people to understand if they don't know that name, because not everybody loves powerlifters like you and I do, but um, can you tell everybody what what Chris has a record for and also his like height and weight roughly so that they can get a picture of this human being because the amount of tightness that was in his spine is not uh, what I see. Every, it's not what I see every day as a chiropractor of, Oh, I'm, my low back is a little tight. Well, this guy, you know, you should look him up and I don't know all the exact numbers these days. So, you know, he can slap me in the face if I'm incorrect, but anyhow, he's built like a brick house. Yeah, He's a freaking giant to begin with. Number one. Number two, he's not a young pup anymore. I think he's about, you know, early 40s now. So to train at that level at that age is pretty amazing. And Uh, I think his record is back squatted a thousand pounds for two. So he did reps with a thousand pounds. Yeah. Yeah. His his deadlifts are uh, over a thousand one hundred pounds at some point in his career. Uh, And I think his squad is like 850 or something. I mean, it's absolutely crazy. And, you know, I've seen him wear a T-shirt that is that really points it out what he's all about. It says, if the bar's not bending, you're just pretending. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So so when we're talking about stiffness, this isn't like, hey, I could stretch it out. This is a significant amount of muscle, a significant amount of muscle density, a significant amount of trained muscle, a significant motor program in his brain, all saying, lock up that posterior pillar or whatever you want to say the posterior chain and what you were essentially doing is creating like a zero sum game where it, it a, a way of simplifying this is take the stiffness out of one area like you're pouring water between two cups right it was all in the right hand cup or in the in the back cup and now you're pouring some of it into the abdominal cup but not all of it you're just getting to a point where it it's not overflowing with tightness do I have that yeah. correct? Yep, yeah, that's it. Now, the right. beautiful thing about this, you know, simple example, but very practical and very quick, right? I mean, it takes me five minutes to change it. Now he does it on his own, so he doesn't even need a practitioner like me, is some clinicians have now used the same principle when they have to manipulate a low back in a patient that is so guarding, so tight, so stiff, so apprehensive, and it gave the same result. I mean, in that case, yeah. they're not deadly. You know, the manipulation I see that successful now. I, 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 the, the thing that comes in my mind is not low back, actually, which I'm sure it's, it's useful for is I can't tell you how many desk workers I have that will talk about neck pain. And then you just ask them to like lie on, lie supine and then take their chin to their chest. And I say, where do you feel that? And they point in the back, you know, and you think about it, you're doing neck flexion with a group of extensor muscles. Like it's so out of bounds, right? And and 
you know, I'm not expecting these people to have high levels of proprioceptive ability either, but it's, you know, it's just that they're, they're so programmed for that. that, And I have found that you can do whatever you want manual therapy wise, but until you correct that relationship, you're going to struggle with neck pain with that person in my, in my clinical experience. Yes. And there's actually some evidence now uh, where researchers have looked at the three concepts I just discussed and uh, neck pain. And so indeed where some isometric loading can totally change the sense of effort in individuals that have chronic uh, neck pain. Yeah, that, which is great because there's, it's so low risk and so high reward. Uh, that's fantastic. Now, now for um, going to practical, so not a world class athlete like Chris, Chris Duffin, but let's just say, um, you know, somebody working with general population, so uh, a thirty five to forty five year old male, you know, who who wants to improve his, I'm trying to think about this, improve his pull ups, you know, either number, ability, volume, less bands, whatever it is. How how does this research kind of apply to to that group of people? Mm-hmm. Well, my personal experience, I've, I've seen that if we look at the concept of bilateral deficit, so in the average athlete or recreational lifter, let's say, exerciser, uh, they typically work more bilaterally than unilaterally in their weight room or in their gym or, you know, their Pilates class or whatever. Uh By now, looking at the unilateral strength, so typically in those individuals, if you measure their, let's say, maximum bench press bilaterally, and let's say it's 200 pounds, if you measure them unilaterally, so right independent from the left side, the total number is higher. So that's weird, right? I mean, it's like, we I'm stronger in my So what you're saying is... Together than my both arms together. Just for people who are listening, uh, when you're saying bench press, let's just say that I, I use a barbell and I can bench press 200 pounds total. And then you hand me an, a dumbbell in each hand and I can strangely do 120 each hand, which should add up to 240 on the bar, but, but I can't do that. I, I fall apart at 200 rather than the predicted max of 240. So if the bilateral weight is heavier than the unilateral weight, then actually I use unilateral weight training before bilateral weight training. Say that again. I just want to make sure I understand. Say that again real quick, Guido. Sure. If I work with an individual, and sometimes you can predict it, you know? So power lifters, unless they're smart as Chris, typically mimic the lifts they need to do during competition. And so they lift exclusively bilaterally, right? Now let's say they get to a max. Let's say they squat 600 pounds and they can't get any heavier. Then if, if they consult me, I would at least measure their bilateral max strength, which is 600, and then I would measure it also unilaterally. If I see that the total of the unilateral strength, right, at left leg or right arm or left leg together is higher, then I would train that unilateral strength to get the bilateral strength up. Now, some athletes is the other way around. So if I work with soccer players, basketball players, individuals that typically only move on one leg, and especially if their weightlifting routine does not include a lot of bilateral lifts, you know, typically we call it functional training, right? We got to keep repeating what you see on the court. I'm not a huge fan of that, really, because we all know that force output and total weight is typically higher when we are with both feet on the ground or both hands moving something when we're stable. But the, the, the information around effort force, uh, the, a sense of effort force and heaviness, you can now use to see if you can manipulate either their unilateral strength deficit or their bilateral strength deficit. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it, it's a further way to profile um, when you're designing a training program to understand like where does this athlete 
have the most potential for gain or potential for opportunity, biggest window of opportunity is that in the bilateral bilateral st- stance or unilateral stance. So for those listening, and Guido, I, I'm, I'm not as smart as you, so I'm just trying to simplify this for everybody listening. Should I train this person in lunges or should I train them in back squats? Yeah. Basically. Yeah, right? yeah. Good example. Yeah. Of course, you also then need to consider what they're already doing in the weight room, right? Right. And to your point about soccer, those yeah, those guys, the only time they're standing with their feet next to each other is at that <laughs> if they're on defense of a penalty kick. Otherwise, <laughs> they're they're on one leg, right? Or they're taking a shower after the game. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Even then, I wonder if they're dropping down, uh, dropping one foot behind. But um, you said something else that that kind of interests me, and in, that the thought of effort, force, and heaviness, can that contribute? Like I see in baseball, for example, they're really starting to make some gains in shoulder health and in these crazy velocities when they're allowing athletes, when they're working with them on uh, under speed or over speed training, or it's called weighted ball programs, but I, I, I think that's like a misleading name. But when I train somebody who is going to do something, say, with a light, you know, five ounce baseball, and I do that with them with a heavier object or a lighter object, does that research that you're talking about apply to those instances as well? Yes, it does, actually, because there is even an overestimation or an underestimation of the weight of the ball. Unfortunately, again, a lot of these companies give these balls a different color. So, you know, if, if, the, if the yellow ball is lighter, well, pretty soon, you know, I'm going to grab a lighter ball. So you're almost now playing with that, that internal model. You're predicting it's lighter. Thereby, you're immediately adjusting your effort force and heaviness to it. Does that make sense? So yeah, I prefer yeah. if people use these you know, heavier or lighter optics, and you see it in golf, you see it in baseball bats, you see it in a variety of sports, you know, to still be careful for a couple of things. Number one, the research that I've read on unusual lifts, so things you've never done before. So you're a young baseball pitcher, and your coach is introducing you to this lighter, heavier, and same weight baseball, let's say. The noviceness is actually a huge advantage. And that's why often the strength coach and the therapist needs to be quite creative to identify which lifts or which exercises, I should say, uh, are novice for the individual and then use that novelty as an advantage. So some of the lifts that I use, they're not you know the weighted ball stuff, but for example, uh, one of the things that I use a lot in strong individuals uh, is a barbell where the bottom is actually attached to the ground. So it it rests on the ground and there's only weight on top. And even the power lifters that I've done this with uh, at Kabuki strength, you know, some young men and young women, very strong, they struggle tremendously with a relatively light weight, like 45 or 90 pounds while they're squatting and deadlifting hundreds of pounds on a, on a daily basis, you know, but that right. novelty where there cannot predict what is going to happen, what this is going to feel like is in the research we show it drives the peripheral system. You feel it, right? And then you change immediately that peripheral system to actually augment your central nervous system to overcome this load. Now, on a practical standpoint with this baseball weight scenario, when I was with the Orioles, for example, we were, and I was, totally against this unloaded and overloaded throwing. The reason then we had was it changed their mechanics. And so we would have not very sophisticated camera equipment, but still we're analyzing our pitchers, you know, and when they threw with the regular baseball at maximum velocity, and then we introduced a lighter and a heavier ball. Now, it plays tricks. You know, this heaviness plays a little trick on you. And so when you throw it a heavier ball and they give you a regular size ball, it's going to feel lighter. Now, you still in sports need to see if this drives 
outcome. Do you have more strikes? Do you win more games? Is your ERA better? Another example was we did some vision training through a company in New York. Uh, you know, it was free because they want to use it as, a, as an advertisement and they want to sell it to us. It was quite expensive. And it was making a difference in vision and making contact with the, with the ball as hitters. But from a statistical perspective, their batting average didn't go up that much. And so, you know, I, I de definitely performance coaches and strength coaches need to be a little bit careful that whatever you throw at your athletes, is it really going to make a difference at the end of the day? Also, oh, man. realize I, I, that if we change central or peripheral drive through whatever exercise, it often has a limited capacity to exist within our brain, let's say. So here's an example. Heavy weightlifting, we've known this for years since the 70s, heavy weightlifting, you know, it changes the Golgi tendon organ sensitivity, becomes more sensitive, thereby we get stronger and are faster. So we jump higher. We are uh, the initial component of uh, sprinting. So taking off is faster, et cetera, et cetera. But it doesn't last. So we need to know and understand that some of our exercises that we are using or that we see others being used might only have a temporary result. And just like Chris Duffin, he needs to do that isolated abdominal exercise between each set because there is no lasting effect. So we need to be a little careful and understand more appropriately, what are we really manipulating? How long does it last? And at the end of the day, are they throwing harder? Or are they running faster? And then how long does it last? Yeah, that the I, I have personally, unfortunately, uh, had the opportunity to make a lot of athletes worse. And I've done it by assuming that, you know, some intervention is great. And then you see their performance numbers take a dump, uh, which really sucks. You know, I worked with golfers and they posted five, five round averages much higher than <laughs> they came into me. Uh, but you know, you learn from those things and certainly it motivates you to be a better provider. But, um, I, I, I think it's interesting that you, you touched on a couple of things. Number one, if you get super heavy or super light, you really can change the mechanics of what somebody's doing. So in golf, for example, um, I would tell everybody listening, like be very careful with the weights that you're doing under speed, over speed, and look at the research and understand it. Because, you know, if I had hand you a golf club, Guido, and I say, Hey, swing this as hard as you can, it's probably going to look like a golf swing. But if I then take a sledgehammer, a 25 pound sledgehammer and, and hand it to you, the movement you do to try and swing that at a ball at the ground is going to be nothing like a golf swing, right? It's going to, it just can't be like, there's too much force and, and it changes the mechanics. So definitely uh, be careful of that. But the other piece that um, I heard you say that I just want people to make sure they, they realize is when you're saying the increased sensitivity of the Golgi tendon organ uh, doesn't last, you're not saying, so don't do that, right? Yeah. What you're saying is know when to do that. Yeah. Like there, that, that's a huge advantage. But it's not a light switch. It's not like, oh, well, if it doesn't last, then we're going to throw this away. It's like uh, altitude training, right? Like you can have a huge advantage. You just have to get your timeline right um, to, to do that. And same thing here. Like at the right moment, it's completely appropriate to use that sensitivity to your advantage. Right. Unfortunately, and this is my personal opinion, I see too many what I would call personal training slash fitness exercises to be incorporated in performance training. And a lot of them don't belong there. And I'm, you know, some people are gonna hate me for it, but here's one example, the Turkish get up. I'm like, oh, but it packs your shoulder, makes you more stable, blah, blah, blah. Well, actually I was involved in a study in South Korea with baseball pitchers who wanted to incorporate the Turkish get up because they were training in a typically CrossFit kind of environment and they liked it, you know, of course. From a fitness perspective, any exercise that is challenging, we're going to love, right? If you love to work out, then anything that's challenging is cuckoo. Yeah, and there, as a general rule, there's nothing more challenging than just getting your body onto the floor and back up. Like, yeah. Turkish so, get-ups, burpees, all saying, that oh, that classification. 
I'm not saying to the listeners here, you need to stop doing that exercise, but does it really have an effect on performance in an athlete? So I don't know which athletes really would benefit from that. But anyhow, go back to the study with the baseball pitchers. So these guys, this is South Korea, when they have their so-called spring training, they're really being isolated. They go to some small little village in the mountains, and that's where their training facility is. They do that with a good purpose. They can control these kids, meaning there's no stores to go get candy or whatever else. None of that jazz exists. So even their diet is completely controlled, what they eat, when they eat, sleep is being monitored, et cetera, et cetera. So for six weeks, we were able to control them quite well. Half of the group, okay, it was a small sample size, about six people. We allowed them to do Turkish get-ups as part of their warm-up before they threw. Because from the concept of if a Turkish get-up loads up your shoulder and improves stability, well, anybody that works in throwing sports says, if that joint gets more stable, then they're going to throw harder. Okay, cool. That's a good idea. The other group, we did not allow them to do that whatsoever. And again, they had no access to that equipment, et cetera. So we're pretty much in control. What did we notice? Number one, throughout the season, now there's less control, I totally admit. We saw a decrease in pitching velocity in those that kept using it. Well, that's pretty significant, number one. Number two, the group that used it had more statistically significant time loss because of injury. Now, not substantial injuries necessarily, you know. I felt sore or whatever else the deal was versus I totally tore up my shoulder and need surgery versus the individuals that did not use it. So performance coaches, and, you know, and I'm probably preaching to the choir here, they know that, number one, if they want to keep their job, <laughs> they better make sure that the athlete performs. If they want to get promoted in their job, they definitely should make sure that the athlete performs at a higher level. And they definitely shouldn't throw, let's call them circus acts at their athletes in the hope that something's going to change and that they are going to perform better. So fitness is totally different than performance. And rehabilitation is different than performance. I don't agree with some individuals that say it's all the same. Well, it might use the same principles to some point, but ultimately, at the end of the day, the end results are different. Thereby, the training should match the end result. Right. Say, saying it's all the same is, is, you know, the exercises can be used in the same, uh, in varying performance, fitness, rehab. We can use the same implements and the same exercises, much like a mechanic would use the same wrenches, screwdrivers, hammers, sockets to fix a semi-truck or a F1 race car. But to say that those are the same thing, it's, you know, it, oh, it's all the same. I just turn these wrenches. It's like, okay, but you're, you're violating kind of the principle here, which is, you know, there, you have to understand the end goal of what you're doing. Is it carry a lot of weight or is it, you know, go incredibly fast and corner hard? Those are very different oh, outputs. Yeah. It's like when I was in professional baseball, you know, uh, one time, you know, I'm out on the field, the players and they're, st they're stretching, they're warming up. And I hear somebody scream out of the stands, you don't know what the fuck you're doing. Those stretches suck. You need to do this and this and this. And uh, my response to that gentleman was, uh, I love you too, buddy. But <laughs> here is the problem a little bit. Uh, People see these clips on YouTube, on TV, and or in life, and they think what those athletes are doing, they should do, or that the practitioner doesn't know what the hell he's doing. They have no idea what happens behind closed doors. That preparation that is individually based, also based on past injuries, some shortcomings in testing, et cetera, and it's a team effort to design an appropriate even stretching program and a warm-up program for an, for an athlete that might be completely different one guy to the next. And then if you work with pro athletes, there's also the psychological effect. They're used to certain things they've done for years. Might not be all scientifically sound, but you're definitely not going to mess with their mind by changing something drastically. It needs to become with, a, with the right intent Everybody needs to be involved, including the, the coaches, coaching staff, if you want to make some changes to a program or even an individual program. 
In rehab, we have a little bit the opportunity now to look not only at, okay, this is your injury, this is what your rehab program is, but look at past shortcomings and then incorporate that into their rehabilitation program, especially when they start doing some more functional stuff. Yeah, sorry, I was on mute again there. No problem. Yeah, I like, um, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with Dan John when he says, oh, yeah. the goal is to keep the goal the goal. Yeah. And that is such a simple way, of, but my God, it is so hard. You know what I mean? Like it, the goal, for example, on stretching is the goal may not be to get baseball players more flexible. The goal is that they win more games, which yeah. tighter athletes might win more games. Like, you know, you have to test all those and be ready to be wrong. Cause, and that's the, that's the difference between the highest levels and the lowest levels, right? Is your willingness to be wrong and, and move on. Uh, well, I had the fortune to uh, actually meet Dan uh, several times. But the first time I met him was in Vancouver, BC. And uh, he did a presentation there. I did a presentation early in the morning and we all had dinner together, sat right next to him. And I'm like, I'm sitting next to a legend, this guy. And I'll never forget yeah. at the end of the day, he kept saying, I need to eat more protein. And he's probably right, you know, because he's huge and I'm not. So that was the kind of the funny interaction. And then I invited him to come to Korea uh, together with Mike Young and Lee Taft, you know, the sprinting coach. And uh, Dan and I had breakfast after his presentation. And I asked him something like, when in your career as a discus thrower, did you inc start incorporating strength training? And he said, actually, it was at the end of my career. I was starting to, you know, not get into the category of getting bronze, silver, and definitely not gold. And my new coach introduced me to weightlifting. And he said, but it didn't really help me. He said, I could, th this, I'm trying to quote him here. He said, I could lift those stairs up, but I couldn't walk up the stairs. <laughs> so, Love it. again, a reason that we need to be careful what we introduce to even an elite athlete like him going to the Olympics. And in his scenario, training you know what i typically call unilaterally your squats your deadlift your bench press didn't really help him to rotate faster with that discus and actually his performance decreased we need to be careful what we manipulate because that's really what we're doing right and in an individual like him it might get him out of a medal in the olympics i mean that is just crazy to think about that outcome right so we need to become a little smarter what we're doing and stop watching YouTube videos. Yeah, I always say like Instagram and YouTube and all that, that's great for you to take those exercises and file them away into your file cabinet of possible exercises I might use for the right reason. Not yeah. definite exercise to use tomorrow with my athletes or with my clients or your, your patients, whatever it is. Absolutely. Like having a, you know, I would guess Guido that, for any major movement, let's just say a squat based pattern, I would guess at this point in your career, you probably have 400 variations. If you include all the implements, intensity, uh, biases, you know, lateralizations, um, you know, position, body position, posture, all those things, there's probably hundreds that you have just for the squat. And for a hip hinge or deadlift, you probably have another bank of hundreds. That's awesome. It makes you better. But and knowing even the when progression the is right different. One. Even the progression is different. So he, here's a little example. If you look at a uh, at a squat, you know your typical squat, the bars on the back, high or low, doesn't really matter that much. And you look at a Olympic weightlifter performing that lift, and then you go into the next room and you see a power lifter performing the same lift, even if it's under the same weight. It looks different. So the power lifter will lean forward. So let's say now that I work with a power lifter that needs to increase his, leg, his or her leg strength, maybe post ACL. I definitely am not, once they are allowed to start doing deadlifts and squats again, definitely will not let them deadlift first because they'll use their back extensors. And even if I need to get to that back squat, then I better put them in a position where they're forced to use their legs more, like an overhead squat, 
where they hold a bar or even just a 45 pound plate over your head. And I challenge the listeners to do that. You know, it's one of my tests. You say you're strong. I'm going to give you a very simple exercise. If you're a female, I'm going to give you a 35 pound plate. If you're a male, a 45 pound plate, I'm going to tell you to head it, head it over to your head. I'm going to tell you to squat as slowly as possible. So your central nervous system has time to adjust to probably in many of you listeners here, a novice squat. You've probably never done that before. And what you'll see is the squat will be more erect, like an Olympic weightlifter. So we need to be very careful even not only which exercise we use in which mode, capacity, reps, sets, rest, all that jazz, right. but also the sequencing and how we use it depending on our goal. Right. Otherwise, they're going to squat like a horse, but guess what? Their quads right. and their hamstrings are still not going to do a lot of work. The majority of their back will be done with their back. Yeah, Research yeah it's fun. Showing people with low back pain although the back is uncomfortable, will use their back consistently, even just picking up groceries or tying up their shoes. So we need to be a little careful here. You know, it's like when I was a grad student at the University of Oregon, you know, I just came out of Belgium, you know, like three months ago or so, and they uh, put me in, uh, in uh, uh, they, they made me work, you know, I was basically doing nothing, watching and, you know, packing ice packs and, you know, do all the gopher stuff. Uh, with the football team. And I saw a guy doing Superman exercises. So in the early 90s, those were really popular for, you know, strengthening your back and if you had back oh, yeah. pain. Yes. Now, clueless that I was, remember, I just came out of Belgium. Didn't have any sports medicine kind of background. Not a lot of rehab background. I was a nurse. You know, I dealt with acute injuries and had very chronic problems. So I asked the head athletic trainer, why is he doing that exercise? And he said something like this, it's to strengthen his low back. And I go, really? This morning, I saw him in the weight room squatting 425 pounds, deadlifting almost 550 pounds. How can this strengthen his back? And right. so, I, you know, maybe I was just a pain in the ass kind of student. I always kind of wondered, you know, why? I mean, there is no overload here. How, can, how in the heck can it strengthen his back? And actually, when he was done with that Superman exercise, he'd walk around like a freaking robot, right? He was as stiff as a freaking board. And that, that's what I see more and more and more in some professional teams, without mentioning any names, they kind of hang their hat on these linear weightlifting patterns in their weight room at very high loads. And, you know, increasing the load to make them stronger. And I, I totally get it. Some athletes just need to get stronger. But if they need to move non-linearly, I need to rotate. How and, you know, how is that going to help me? Should we not at some point transition into more non-linear patterns in the weight room? And, you know, I know a lot of fantastic strength coaches uh, that, that actually do that. But I still see so many not do it. And the same thing in the rehab world where it's like, when are you going to do this? So we need to be a little careful how and when and, and with what we expose our patients, our, our clients, our athletes to, uh, because the end result might not be exactly what, what we're looking for. And, and then it's sad that some of these individuals, either their staff or they themselves, reach out to a person like me and where a very simple change in their program eliminates their problem. Yeah. I think again, man, you're, you know, you're preaching to the choir. Like it's, I think about in the rehab space, just changing from a, a Olympic uh, a weightlifting style squat to a powerlifting squat may, you may choose either one of those because of how much or how little dorsiflexion you want in the ankles and you have to have that global view. So I, I completely agree with you. Real quick, uh, Guido, I want to share with people where they can get a hold of you and, and you know, see wh where your courses are and where you'll be um, speaking. But before that, let me do a quick little live read for our, our software. Uh, you know, Guido and I have been talking all about when to use certain tools and, and how to assess people to use certain tools. And it's not just important in training, but it's also important in your communication with your patients. And if we look at how do people communicate, 
We'll keep coming back to text messaging, which is why Clinic Gym Connect is a two-way text messaging for your office to work with your clients, your patients, everybody in your, in your office, make your staff's life easier and automate as much as you can without losing that personal connection. So we have all sorts of campaigns and methods using two-way text communication with our people. So we know the message gets through, gets through. If you're relying on email, unfortunately, there's only about a 20% open rate in emails, let alone uh, uh, what percent of those get read and what percent of those take action on. Whereas we can eliminate all that extra waste by just using text messaging. So if you're interested, go to clinicgymconnect.com. Again, that's clinicgymconnect.com and check it out there. It's built for clinicians like you, for trainers like you, gym owners, clinic owners, and everything. So with that, Guido, uh, if people have heard your your sweet, uh, sweet accent and thought this dude is onto something and I love what he's talking about and what he's what he's saying, where can people find more information about your education and where you're speaking? Well, uh, the next event will actually be at Kabuki Strength in uh, Portland, Oregon. That's uh, October 15 from 12 to 6. It's basically I'm introducing an introductory uh, workshop to their weekend workshop. Um, So that's number one. That will be done in live, remote and recorded. So if you cannot attend, you can, you know, live attend. And if that doesn't work, you can always uh, purchase the uh, recording afterwards. It's not expensive. Live attendance is like, I think, two seventy five dollars or something. Uh, we just want more people to know about this. Uh, and is that registration through on Kabuki's website, which is, I think, kabukistrength.com? Correct. Okay. Yeah. And, and for those who haven't, if you've never uh, seen Kabuki Strength, it is a, a company that is pushing the limits of, what the human body can do in powerlifting and, and coming out with great tools, great barbells, great, it, just great education around the idea of making people stronger. So I highly, highly recommend it. Yes. Uh, yeah. Look up anything uh, around Kabuki strength. Uh, like, like you said, their equipment is superior locally made by the way. So you don't have the waiting times of something being shipped. And just, it's just well thought out too. I mean, they're deadlifting yeah. bar now. Everybody's copying it, but my God, the way they set up a trap bar, I was like, this is genius. It's pure yeah. genius. It's so much better than all these extra, extra, you know, ways of doing it. Anyway, so go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, they, they have put the best people together, including full-time engineers to construct actually new equipment. So absolutely fantastic. Uh, of course, Google uh, Chris Duffin himself, which is the poster child uh, of the company. Uh, my website is called Kinetic integrations.com and that is also the name of my facebook page i'm becoming more active i'm not a big social media kind of guy uh, that's why a lot of people don't know who the heck i am they're like who is this guy uh i i kind of like to be in you know, a little bit more in the background i don't need all that social hoopla and twitter Did you remember do you remember watching that show in the 80s the the a team yeah they would always say if you need help and you can find them <laughs> you can hire the A team. That was the the caveat. So you're kind of the A team of strength and conditioning, right? Like you put in the effort to find Guido, he'll help you out. But uh, yeah, if you want to reach out to me, so I do uh, in uh, live as also Zoom sessions internationally uh, with a ton of athletes and non athletes uh, through my uh, my uh, email address, which is Safe Recovery. That's one word, Guido. So Safe Recovery Guido, all one word at gmail.com and and don't be afraid to call me you know uh, as long as you don't ask me stupid questions you're not going to get any stupid answers i always say yeah uh, phone number is 541-602-3085 and at, at this moment in my career i'm i'm hitting uh you know i'm over 62 now i'm starting to approach 63 i want to share information i want to share knowledge uh i'm not going to be around forever and i I don't want you know all the years that i've put in uh, even today i I read at least an hour two hours a day uh to improve my clientele which are patients which are regular individuals let's call it which are some of them fitness crossfit people uh as also elite athletes of a variety of sports uh don't hesitate to reach out zoom is actually confidential if you get the right link on Zoom. And so uh, we can easily share information and uh, 
I had quite a bit of success since COVID. I was pretty much forced to, you know, change direction and it's working out. So reach out to me if you want to learn some cool stuff. Uh, even those of you that might be students, uh, I've always have mentored students still do. Uh, if, if you got the right intent, I will help you. I love it. I love it. It's everything we're about here, Dito. So, well, listen, I really appreciate you coming back on and sharing this information with us and, and kind of expanding our knowledge base in a way we, we had. The most exciting thing is you help us understand the way we should approach the problem, which is by not getting committed to any solution, but just asking the right questions. So for that, sir, I really appreciate your time today. Uh, on behalf of Guido, this is Dr. Josh Satterley saying, go out there, maximize your license, and live the life you dream of. Thank you so much, Guido. Thank you, Josh. Thanks so much for checking out these videos. I hope they're useful. We'll cover things like rehab, exercise, business model, progressions, layout, everything else that helps you build a clinic. So if you're interested, you can click here, there, here, here, or anywhere to get more videos just like this. Thanks a lot for watching, and we'll see you soon.